Welcome to the discussion panel on Jews, gay people, and the Holocaust following our screening of Bent on occasion of Holocaust Memorial Day 2023. This is an event uh, co-organized by the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Manchester and Manchester Reform Synagogue. Uh, my name is Kathy Gelbin, and um, I'm, I've curated the, the film series of which uh, Bent was kind of the final uh, screening today. Uh, I very much look forward to the, uh, if one can say that, look forward, but nonetheless, uh, I do, to uh, the panel discussion uh, with our panelists, um, whom I'll introduce in a moment. Um, but to uh, say at the start that this um, is an open uh, discussion, and we would be very happy to include questions uh, from you. So if you want to send us questions, uh, we'd be uh, delighted to receive them. Uh, please raise them uh, throughout the discussion now, the panel discussion, uh, by opening the Q&A window, typing your question into the Q&A box, and then clicking send. And that way, your question will be sent directly to the panelists. Um, and we hope to include as many contributions as possible. Um, so uh, with that having said, and looking forward to your questions too, um, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists, uh, Rabbi Robin Ashworth-Steen, who's the principal rabbi at Manchester Reform Synagogue and co-chair of Greater Manchester Citizens, Dr. Hannah Ewens, who is senior lecturer in modern history and the current head of history and archeology span at the University of Chester. And Greg Thorpe, a curator, writer, and cultural producer uh, and festival director for Gaze, which is Ireland's international LGBTQ film plus, LGBTQ plus film festival. Uh, welcome to you all and thanks for joining us uh, in the discussion uh, panel this evening. Maybe we can start sort of with a few uh, reflections on the film that we've uh, that we've just watched, and um, I'd be interested in hearing maybe your your initial impressions of the film. Maybe also how well it has has aged. Um, this is, after all, it's uh, the twenty fifth anniversary of its uh, release uh, this year, and it was recently uh, restored and uh, put on DVD, um, so digitized and put on DVD and. Uh, I mean, the effect of it, seeing it, uh, the, the DVD version of it tonight, the digital version is, uh, for me, visually quite stunning because I was only used to the very grainy VHS ver version, um, which uh, was was uh, on sale, I think, in the, in the 1990s and then more or less disappeared for many years. And you, it was difficult to get any copies of the, of the film uh, at all, which is possibly why Eitan Fox included um, a restaged sequence from the play in his own film, uh, The Bubble, which was also part of the film series to kind of bring it back into, into memory. So yeah, maybe just some, some initial thoughts on what you, um, uh, your impressions of the film and um, whether you thought it was an effective portrayal, maybe at least in parts or, um, and yeah, how well has it aged 25 years on? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, respond to that. I think I think that I've got a lot of affection for this uh, for this film for I think more almost more political reasons than aesthetic reasons. Uh, I think the film feels very much like a filmed play, um, which, which is of course what it is. Um, but it, it was really responsible in a lot of ways. The the original play. Um, for bringing the conversation into the public consciousness that there was such a thing as a, a gay Holocaust um, experience, um, and it did, it it had a tremendous and unexpected successful run on the West End, and then again on on Broadway. And actually, um, Ian McKellen, who plays the uncle in this, played the younger character in in the in the original play. So there's sort of kind of a, a queer theatrical heritage to it as well. Um, and I feel like it's 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 slightly clumsy in lots of ways that a, a contemporary playwright may not uh, um, have made those same errors, but the material itself was was really so new. And in that way, I think I have a lot of affection for it because it was such a bold um, statement really. And I'm sure was people's, a lot of people's first awareness of uh, of gay men specifically and, and the Holocaust. So for that reason, I think, you know, it, it's as strong as ever, I would say. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Could you maybe say a little bit about sort of what what the boldness uh, of the film is is about? What, yeah, what, made, you know, what made it bold? Yeah, I think I think um, I think there's been a lot of um, reticence to um, to make. Uh, to make art about the Holocaust that isn't deeply rooted in in a factual experience, but really the the job of the artist in some ways is to reach into the places where the stories cannot possibly be resurrected and sort of fill in for those lives. And I feel I feel like that's quite a courageous thing to do because the fear of quote unquote getting it wrong must be quite um, must be quite overwhelming for an artist. I feel like there's a lot of love and compassion and also there's a lot of politics. I mean, it comes across kind of as exposition a lot of times. So you get the, the, you get the names of all the Berlin gay bars, you get the, uh, the mention of, of Hirschfeld and the, and the clinic and of Ernst Röhm and things that hopefully we'll talk about this evening. So it feels like it's kind of, a, there's lots of exposition in order to teach us a lot of, a lot of things. Um, and, and I feel that pressure in the, in the text to get things right. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the flip side of that, the fear of getting it wrong, which is to, I don't know, I don't want to put words in the playwright's mouth, but to 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 conjure up experience that is still is still contentious because it's such a foggy area of history. I mean, the estimates are somewhere between five and fifteen thousand um, gay men who 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 were put into um, internment camps for various reasons, um, and I think it's kind of a, a big responsibility. For, the, for an artist to delve into that but having said that also a really necessary one I think and I you know I'd love to hear what other people have to say about about that kind of fine line I suppose yeah uh would anyone Hannah Robin pick, like to pick that up yeah I can pick that up um I'm a historian and so uh, I I suppose I can appreciate exactly what Greg is saying I think it is a really fine line and um one that the filmmakers perhaps can sort of stumble over, but but equally, I think historians are also guilty of trying to hold filmmakers to account or expect them to hold a certain sort of moral compass or or have to perform um, in in ways that adhere to, let's say, historical conventions um, or historiographical conventions, but but don't always therefore allow for the aesthetic um, properties. Uh, and the importance of that and I was really struck in the film I think like Greg was saying it, it was very clear to me that this had been a play and it still had had those dimensions to it but for me that notion of it being really quite stripped back is what made it feel so powerful and compelling those performances and the staging of it was very stripped back um, if you compare that to something like Schindler's List where you've got you know all of that sort of filmic technique being plowed into it um this felt like quite a different experience but was you know arguably as powerful if not more so I think because of that and managed to get many of the um the underlying um, message across I think and and through that vehicle use it as a mechanism really for talking about gay experience during this period Robin yeah, I, I went on such a journey watching that. It's the first time I've watched it. And I went from moments of crying, uh, moments of having to turn away from the film, uh, moments of real anger, <laughs> um, confusion. I really feel like I went through every single emotion. I've kind of had a bit of a transformation during that as well. Um, I'm re I was really struck by one particular theme that came out that I think is we're sort of um, talking to as well, which is about hiddenness, hidden identities. Um, and what is seen and what's not seen, what's heard, what isn't heard. And certainly the film draws us in, doesn't it? There's, you know, taking off the glasses. Um, there's the picnic, that awful scene where there's a man and woman eating as they, they're marching to the camp. And there's lots of laughter and people kind of observing. Um, and the German officers saying, I see everything and making Max, are you watching at the end? And then at the end, you know, he Hurst runs towards to make sure he's seen in the last of his death throes. So that was really playing with the hiddenness about what it is to hide identities. And Uncle Freddie, there's a, a real strong scene, isn't there, about that, um, about how to hide or, or what's necessary and how to resist as well, which is another theme. Um, but I 
was really kind of attuned to the lack of female voice within it um, and the lack of the Jew in some ways. Um, and I'm not sure whether that's OK or isn't. I'm not I'm kind of neutral, but I noticed it. So I noticed that the only female that we we heard was the woman muttering on the bench who had lost her mind. And the only woman that we saw was objectified and raped in this kind of male dominated world that we have. And in certainly in German and Nazi Germany as well, we didn't see her just just the body, not even the scene. Actually, that scene was hidden where we saw a lot of other bodies and a lot of other um, erotic, which I'm sure is a theme we'll pick up on in a minute and violence. Um, and the Jew, I thought, and going back to what Greg said, that amazing um couple of lines that Horst and Max said to each other as they was marching, you're not Jewish, you're queer. I could be both. You told me it's the lowest, so is the star. And I thought, actually, that's incredibly radical now. And I think the, the film, in some ways, which is worrying to me, feels really radical still. And I'm kind of sitting with that. So maybe that's enough for now. I have lots more to say. But hiddenness, I think, and being seen and not seen and whose voice is in there is something that really struck me. Uh, yeah, I hadn't picked up on that that theme theme um, about seeing, but also about bearing witness, you know, for, for better or worse. And I, I just recalled about the character of Greta, who, who has the luxury almost to become George again and to go to church and to assimilate. You know, and the way the way that queerness can be invisible in the way that, you know, Jewishness, if you have a birth certificate, cannot be hidden, you know. And so all of these different nuances. And I and I think that's also what I meant about the about the courage to lean into a story that feels like it it's its ownership is is elsewhere. Um and 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 especially because by the end of the film, we know that the, the, these character stories could not possibly have survived to the camp. And so the, the arc of fiction is very, very strong because we know that it's a um, it's not it's not been um, drawn from like love letters or memory or anything because they're in isolation. So it is a real leap of fantasy. But I love that. Um, I love that thread that you noticed. So, Robin, that's really illuminating, actually, for me. Yeah. Um, I like, Greg, what you, what you said about kind of the importance of, of fiction, because, of course, fiction in the whole debate around representing the Holocaust has had a, a very contentious place where in the 1980s, 1990s, most cultural critics of Holocaust representation seem to kind of agree that fiction, and this is kind of probably also taking from Claude Lanzmann, Shoah, and Lanzmann in the 1990s condemning Spielberg for having made fiction, where presumably Lanzmann kind of abstains from fiction. Um, and so, so fiction becomes this kind of um, genre of Holocaust representation that is or form of Holocaust representation that is seen as somehow illegitimate because it, it falsifies. Um, it doesn't tell us as it really was. And because as a form, it doesn't work. Um, you may know and recall the kind of famous uh, expression, which is attributed to, to Elie Wiesel, but not, I think not quite clear whether he actually said it or said it in that way. Um, a, a novel about the Holocaust is either not a novel or it is not about the Holocaust. Uh, so the, the extremeness of this event seems to explode conventional forms, conventional narrative forms, and therefore these become impossible and therefore fiction is impossible. And, and what, you're, what you're saying is kind of that uh, with these kinds of stories, we need fiction because we actually have these historical gaps. We have the gaps with, we have gaps with sources. I mean, we have gaps with sources uh, related to the camps more generally, don't we? I mean, we, we, we don't really know. I mean, we have memoirs, but in, there are many facets of um, victimization and of existence in the camps that we don't really know that much about, um, or we can only kind of glean them from memoirs, from survivor reports, but even there, they're sort of quite sparsely uh, touched on. Um, I'll mention in this context actually the topic of sexuality yeah, being one of the, the um, themes that are often writ written out and not treated because they're not deemed appropriate. So, um, I mean, I think this is one of my broader questions also in relation to the film. Um, you know, do we actually need se sexual representation in the context of the Holocaust? Is it, is it really, um, is, it, is it necessary or is it better to, to kind of, 
steer clear of it because it raises so many problems with voyeurism, uh, sexualizing atrocity. And I mean, this film seems to tap all, you know, to tap into all of these. Um, what do we what do we do with that? And is it actually in the in the context of the partic this particular topic because gayness, queerness, homosexuality in the term of the day, that that type of difference is is actually about sexuality. So is there actually then a place in Holocaust representation where asserting sexuality or sexual representation becomes important? I mean, these films certainly seems to seem to feel that because it is so uh, so obvious that they they feature these quite sort of explicit sexual the scenes in many instances. Um, those of you who saw the well, we kind of put it first, even though it was a uh, on-demand film. Um, but um, the recent film, Great Freedom, uh, which which seems to kind of take this head on and and uh, you know shows the uh, life of a of a gay man in Nazi prisons um, and who sort of has sex sort of throughout. And the film is quite quite sort of open about that. So. But it's it, but these are some of the, the tensions really that these films seem to gauge. And one of my questions is sort of, yeah, wh where do we draw the line, or where do we feel this is sort of successful and necessary, and where is it, does it sort of veer off, you know, or veer sort of out of our comfort zone, maybe? So these are a lot of questions and comments, but I don't know if you. I'm happy to uh, jump in with that. Yeah, go for yeah, it. Yeah, I think this is one of the things that I went on a real journey through, actually, um, from the beginning, but particularly the scene that um, I started to feel really uncomfortable with, um, where they were standing next to each other and had um, sex together. Um, and um, he says, we can feel each other. And I started to feel uncomfortable because I've never seen a Holocaust film or anything where that kind of scene happens within a camp. And I started to feel uncomfortable. And then I started um, to think about Audre Lorde's work. Um, and she particularly writes an essay called Uses of the Erotic and makes it really clear that actually stepping into bodies, having queer bodies on our screen is a real act of defiance and subversion. Um, and she talks about the kind of powers that we have used and unused and how the oppressed um, are oppressed because the erotic is suppressed um, and actually being able to step into love, being able to feel as opposed, it is a, is a type of doing and activism in a world where no doing is allowed. Um, and I thought actually that was so powerful and I haven't seen that kind of depicted in such a, in, in such a, a radical, courageous um, and real way. Um, it's really kind of anti-patriarchal, it's anti um, you know, that the homophobic world that we live in, it's really an important message to see it um, in our world generally, but also within the oppression of the Shoah, of the Holocaust, where bodies and humanity were suppressed. Um, and I think that was really beautiful that for me, it wasn't um, kind of gratuitous sex. It was very much about feeling. It was sensuality and it was love. So there, and I, therefore, as Audrey Lord says, that's not pornographic. Pornographic is where love and feeling is taken out of it. Maybe that's interesting from the beginning of the film to later on. I don't know. Um, but there's something in the sensuality in the being able to feel. And I'm also remembering that scene of the woman and how far away that feels from where we end up in that. Um, but for me, you know, and all the conversations about queers aren't allowed to love and them choosing love in that space, um, I thought actually that's where the film kind of got me. It was in that scene where I found a real sense of activism and, you know, maybe within the fantasy of that moment, uh, it's not clear to me, but um, yeah, uses of the erotic by the oppressed. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so it's interesting to think about the period in which it was written because it's it's kind of at the height of gay liberation and also pre-aid. So it's in that kind of golden era, if you like, of of sexual freedom and like the the creation of the urban gay man and the um, and the sexual liberation that that came with that. And to have the 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 key sex scene on stage. I mean, it was a really famous scene that that you've described. To have the key sexual scene on stage as being a point at which two men don't touch was a radical thing in, in that setting. And, but also it, an act of resistance, not just between the two characters, like we can still connect, but an act of resistance um, 
for, for the spectators as well, I think, to say, you know, we will always survive. And and, and what you were saying before, Kathy, about, um, you know, the trepidation around fiction, and I think, to be honest, it's going to happen anyway. And, um, and I think it's done... I think it's done as badly as often as it as it's done well around around queer history and around Holocaust history and, and at those intersections. But I always think like Toni Morrison says that art is a thing that makes another thing possible. And so the motion through that and through our own context is, is always, always a process of, of, of learning. But there are also the um, the thorny things that that kind of cannot be touched that art makes the conversation possible around. And I was thinking about the ending of, of Great Freedom, which is partly, I think, about um, if, if for anyone who hasn't hasn't watched the slight spoiler alert, in that um Great Freedom follows an even rarer story, which is about the, the gay men who who survived Nazi Germany and then were re-imprisoned under the new regime to complete their um, custodial sentences for well lewd behavior um paragraph i forget 157 or, 175, or, or, yeah. 175 which was the which was the broad uh, category for any sort of gay behavior and they had to serve those two years and those two years if you had been in a concentration camp for for that time that didn't count towards your sentence and so uh, um I think um, it, it's down to us to insist on the lived realities of those of those uh, men, um, because otherwise they they would be lost to time almost certainly. And there's a lot of rage there. Um, and to hear someone um, to, to hear historical rage about the Holocaust from someone who who is is not Jewish still feels. Um, Kind of uh, raw and untamed because uh, because it's because it's still so rare. But I think it can be received with like compassion and nuance. But the end of that film does trouble me slightly because the, the character has obviously been institutionalized by prison, which we know is a, is a real thing. But something about the freedom of the gay men that he encounters, he seems to find quite almost revolting. And I was unsure about what that signified. And I'd be interested to know if other people have seen that or. Um, but yeah, I said a lot there, but it's a it's a big it's a big picture. <laughs> Hannah, I don't. I was wondering if you um, wanted to jump in or. Yeah, I thought the 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 point that both Robin and, and Greg were making about, I suppose, this broader issue of do we allow art to get at his at history that perhaps is otherwise lost. Um, and I think we have to remember that if we didn't have art as a vehicle to do that, then these these histories, these stories, these experiences, these traumas, it would be another mechanism of silencing them. So actually using art, using film, um, using um, recreative techniques is a way of trying to um, give voice to those histories and to those stories. And I think that's a that's a really powerful thing and um i suppose that would be my main sort of overarching thought when you know in this discussion but also thinking about what what that film particularly achieves in looking to resurrect those stories i think and, and we will have fragments there will be testimony but i think because just as greg had alluded to because of the ongoing persecution after the second world war you know all those fragments they're not given opportunity to surface um, and ultimately become lost so there's opportunities for capturing testimony after the event are lost and people are silenced um, and so it goes on so I think art is the it, it, it provides a, an important way in really um, and, and means that that we can all get to that history in ways that we might not otherwise manage mm. can I just um yeah. follow on from that point because it's so interesting because and, and I'm, I'm, I am slightly obsessed with Audre Lorde so you'll have to forgive me who uh, was born in the 30s and a black woman scholar activist writer but one of her other really powerful essays is poetry is not a luxury so all these uh, art forms poetry uses of the erotic are all forms of activism of the oppressed and it's really interesting how we're seeing it play out particularly in this um 
film and one thing that I also wanted to say um following on from what Greg said was um I, I also picked up the theme of animals and humans so there was a really powerful scene at the moment at the beginning that got my attention when um the two men are running away from the club having just seen um the officer killed by other Nazi officers um and the women the man and the woman the, you know the heterosexual couple close their curtains and it's the dog when they're running out that looks out to see what's happening. I thought that was such an amazing um, commentary on the lack of humanity in Nazi Germany. Um, and it's interesting when we're talking about erotic and, you know, the feeling and the sensual as, as opposed to the pornographic. That's obviously more animal, you know, the pornographic in some ways. Uh, obviously, animals love and are very tender. Um, but there's something about that as a juxtaposition that I really felt um, and a theme that I really thought was very true because a lot of this art of whatever fantasy it spoke such deep truths was max's own um tricky uh decisions that he had to make moral decisions that he was forced to make um and his kind of playing with the excitement of pain i thought that was a really interesting and unexpected theme actually that he said even towards the end but i like pain it's exciting um i thought that really opens up that whole conversation about um the little Nazi within everybody and, you know, our propensity to evil and humanity. And I wasn't expecting it and I felt really uncomfortable with it. But I think that's the power of it is that it, it sat really uncomfortably within me. I mean, that and that also connects to um, to great freedom because the, the gay bar that he encounters, I guess his first gay bar out of prison is kind of like an s &M dungeon scene where there's kind of... Um, prison paraphernalia as part of, uh, you know, an s &M experience. And I, I'm thinking about the completion of that phrase, great freedom, with great freedom comes great responsibility. It's almost like the, his aversion to that is the aversion to, to, to pain as well. Um, but there is one of the kind of complex um, kind of historical threads is around those relationships between, you know, s &M, leather, early gay liberation, urban gays, and and, and Nazi signifiers and Nazi paraphernalia. And I guess my my coming out book was uh, was Lawrence Mass's Confessions of a Jewish Wagnerite. And that's all about how his coming into consciousness as a gay Jewish uh, Wagner fan and the cultural clashes that, that forced him to confront his own anti-Semitism. And it was there that I realized, I mean, if you, if you Google Eagle's Nest, two things come up, the famous leather bar and chain of leather bars around the States and Hitler's um, retreat in the in the mountains of, of Bavaria. So there's a def and and even the eagle um, the eagle insignia and all of these things. There was a kind of a troubling, um, say, masochistic cultural thread that that Jewish gay men had to confront um, in that era. That's kind of been lost to history almost. And those nuances, I think, let's not shy away from them because they're part of an intersexual intersectional Jewish and and gay um experience um i don't think they've been tackled very well in, in art actually so far and and kathy you were saying before about you know and we and robin as well about the uses of the erotic and the the, the usefulness of those things um and another thing that that lawrence mass talks about in this book is you know uses of humor and him and his partner, his, his partner was a, a great um, gay liberationist and an AIDS activist and also a Jewish historian. And they, they between them as two gay Jewish men said, was there any place for humor in the Holocaust or in our responses to the Holocaust? And then a whole book was written about, you know, because their instinct was that where, where Jewish urban culture is, there will also be humor no matter what. And it was almost beyond the pale for them to have that conversation. And then all of these books and these uh, anecdotes and these testimonies came out where humor was really potent so it's it's really interesting to me how these things rise up to the surface over over time but just could could just as easily be lost if that makes sense yes um but i i have to confess i mean of course there are also um holocaust comedies in film that have um i mean this was several since the 1990s um, but uh, I mean, to be or not to be is maybe the, or even um, Charlie Chaplin's great dictator are of course kind of early early precursors. And Charlie Chaplin was of course not not Jewish, but Anselm Butch who made uh, to be or not to be was. Um, but 
I mean, maybe I'll play devil's advocate a little bit here because we are having a discussion after all. But 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 I do continue to find the issue of of sexual representation uh, problematic and and contentious. And also, I think um, and when, when I watched Bent again uh, today, uh, what what did really absolutely jar for me was precisely that expression. Um, I'm here because I want to be here. Uh, and and maybe when you say great freedom kind of makes that move in the end where he kind of chooses to go back, that is, that's maybe a parallel move and maybe it is a kind of a reference implicitly to, to Bent. I mean, it seems to be a parallel move in any case. I think it works better for me in great freedom because I think the strength of great freedom and it's a, it's a film um, that I saw last year when it came out, and I, I was really I was was expecting to hate it because I have to confess that I have hated most queer Holocaust representations so far. I found them extremely troubling. I found them relativizing. Uh, I found them poorly informed historically. And even though I'm a uh, I'm a cultural studies person, um, I I do hold art historically responsible. At, Art about the Holocaust, certainly, I think uh, it's definitely uh, films have become much better since they try to be as accurate as possible. Uh, they're still telling fictions, but they they still try to get sort of the, the contextual facts right. And, and I think we've had much, much better films and much better uh, discussions as well. Um, but... Uh, I, yes, so uh, I think one of the strengths of uh, Great Freedom and why I found myself actually really, um, in the end, loving this film was it doesn't try to make this comparison between gay, gay men and Jews. It just tries to treat the question, the issue of gay men during the Holocaust on its own. And, and so therefore it doesn't sort of end up with trying to show one thing by relativizing the other. And I think that's one of the weaknesses of, of Bend in that it sort of pretends that being Jewish is a choice. Um, you know, the, the character uh, dons uh, the, the, the marking that's used for Jews, the, the yellow triangle pretends to be Jewish and has, uh, by doing that, seems to have a better survival chance than the character who wears the pink triangle. And that is a gross misrepresentation, which I find extremely problematic. And, you know, talking about angry, Robin, when you said, um, you know, you, you felt angry in times when you watched the film, you may have felt angry at different things, but that's something that makes me extremely angry. And it also made me angry again when I was, when I was watching it just now, I was actually actively scoffing. At <laughs> um, still, um, I also, I think uh, having watched so many of these films now and also feeling that there really is a need and a time to have um, effective portray Holocaust portrayals that deal with the persecution of gay men particularly but also lesbian women uh, and who were persecuted in, in other ways or oppressed let's say um, but we really need effective representations of that because there are so many myths around that and I find I think it's time for me it's time to sweep away the myths and to kind of to to deal again with the, to face the historical realities and to face both that these stories of persecution were not all the same but that it's at the same time the suffering that they brought about must not be minimized either way and not with regard to any of these the victim groups who were persecuted so um I think we need these kinds of, or for me, this is a time where I really want to want to now finally see uh, the kinds of portrayals that are that can deal with the complexity of these issues. And I think maybe so for myself, I've also arrived at a point where, um, in relation to these queer portrayals in particular, um, I feel like yes, here sexual sexual representation is important and it does have a place and it does. I mean, when Robin, when you say it's a, it was a it's a radical film, is is that part of why it's radical? Because it kind of dares dares to do that, and we st and we still feel like it's you know, and we're in two thousand twenty three, and we still feel like that's such a sort of almost transgressive thing to do. In terms of uh, of of representation and authenticity, I think I think a mediocre attempt 
through art at, at telling something so serious can actually be in a front and I, I quite often think that when I see biopics and things like that that are very diminishing or simplifying and I sometimes think this is the one chance to get this element of history right and it's probably the one that will stick in the public consciousness much more than than a historical text or maybe even relative testimony or anything like that it's the one that will stick so I, I agree with you Kathy I get a lot of frustration and impatience around it and then there's other examples that I can think of that I'm and, and also thinking of what you were saying Hannah about art as the teaching opportunity so I wondered I mean if other people have seen in transparent and um and that kind of queer Jewish heritage and that that epigenetic trauma and all of those interesting things that that I kind of learned through watching Transparent, one of which was was about the Hirschfeld Institute, and I, I think it had often been mis sort of misrepresented to me as a sort of place where, you know, what we would now consider to be LGBTQ people were sort of poked and prodded and maybe experimented on in quite a clinical way. I never had conceived of it as a community. I, I didn't even realize that Hirschfeld himself was was a gay Jewish person it had been presented in and, and also it had been told to me that the institute had been burned down and that's not actually what happened like the collection the library there was amongst the first papers to be burned publicly but the institute the building remained and was turned into yet another nazi headquarters which to me is a much more, more painful ending and that hirschfeld himself witnessed the burning of his library in a cinema watching it on a cinema screen in paris which to me is just so exquisitely painful the, the vision of it on a cinema screen um and I, and I I don't know how authentic all of that all of that um, feeling and energy is but the characters who who are imagined to be connected to the Hirschfeld Institute in, in transparent I found so moving and beautiful and they were there as themselves and that their desire and their sexual desire was not actually part of it but their identity as a collective of gender transgressive people, whether that be gay or trans or whatever, was, I just thought, so beautifully, like, um, evocative. So I think it can be done really, really, really well and really gracefully as well. I just wanted to drop that example in there, something that moved me. Yeah. Um, Thanks for that. I, I, sorry, I've got, I, I want to hear Hannah's reflections as well, because I'm sure with your work, this is all very much part of it. But one quick thing I wanted to say about from the thing of art being teaching, what, I've, what I really realise is I often don't ever watch Holocaust films or read Holocaust books because of the trauma carried. I just I find it too hard and I've, I've never found particular good ways of me being able to process some of that with that kind of art form. But I have to say, having seen it and then having this conversation for me is the way I now if I'm going to ever do it is going to be through conversation dialogue and in that way this the kind of you know poor attempts at this and the intersexuality intersectionality um, and Kathy I was completely with you of like throwing something at the screen at that point and also at the end where he takes he takes off the badge to reclaim his um, gay identity which is great absolutely although obviously very complicated scene but then the star gets buried and I thought no why do this you know it's like David Baddiel's new book Jews Don't Count where it's this kind of well Jews have it worse and they have it worse it's like we can have our own experience and they are very distinct and very painful and in in some ways you know anyway but like we all have our distinct experience but we're all part of a system of oppression we're all victims of that and the, the powers in the collective so for me there's something about I'm okay with these kind of films if I could be like a dictator and say you have to have conversation after you've got to then be able to pick out why was that a problem because if we do everything so well we then miss where we don't do it so well and we miss the opportunity to say we're humans and we perpetrate tropes and here's how easily did you see how subtle that was and we missed that you know that Jews have money I mean there was an you know this guy with a star all of a sudden had the money in the camp that for me jarred as well but we get to talk about it and lift it up and say look how easy it is to fall into it so that art is teaching I think it kind of goes to your point that that if we can have this kind of conversation then actually that mitigates the harm caused in some way yeah, I think to, to come on in, to come into that, that was making me think about lots of things as you were both replying there. Um, sometimes in my teaching, I try to be quite provocative um, and present my students with 
two very different types of Holocaust film to watch um, <laughs> and uh, and sort of see what happens from that and then try and have those conversations, you know, so um, maybe get the students to watch uh, something like Schindler's List and then something like Inglorious Bastards and, and both of them just come at this from such different angles and the students are often outraged um, by the second choice uh, and feel much more comfortable with the first. But both of them, of course, have all of these complexities, all of these challenges. Um, but I suppose what, what matters underneath that is it gets the students to think critically about art, um, about the complexity, the complex relationship between art and history, and, and kind of that point that Kathy was speaking to as well, able to recognize the that that invisible um line between the two as well you know that one is not just going to be um a parallel for the other that they need to understand that this is this is a, a form of interpretation um but i think this broader issue around intersectionality i think perhaps it it, it comes very much in a moment um when bent is made that these conversations are also happening within holocaust historiography as well there's a kind of a reticence to recognize victims who are Jewish and women for example you know what what do you do with uh, what do you do with the distinctive experience of Jewish women compared to Jewish men and, and, and many historians throughout the 1980s were quite uncomfortable with actually thinking about the distinctiveness of that experience they, they, they accused others who wanted to do this history of having a feminist agenda um, but I think now we're sort of, dare I say, at a point of maturity when we can recognise, as you were saying, Robin, that 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 you can have both, that these experiences are going to be very complex. Um, and to try to uh, talk about one is not to diminish another. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we do have some audience uh, questions, so I'd like to... Uh, make some space for those as well, although I could go on and on talking about these, but we'll probably have lots to talk about uh, in response to the audience questions as well. But um, maybe um, I'm wondering, Hannah, may maybe for you as a historian, whether this would be a question to maybe uh, respond to this is a this play or film, meaning Bent looks at the Shoah from a British remove. What does that do to the depiction of it? I mean, I think we can all speak about it, but maybe um, that's one you'd like to take. Yeah, um, I suppose I hadn't sort of thought through that particular angle on it um, enough yet, because this is my first viewing of the film. I was very aware, I suppose, that they were very British actors in this. And I think in many ways it, it had that sort of... Um, that sort of uh, dimension to it perhaps as well told through that very British lens and it would be I think more interesting to ask how would this film have been viewed um, by a German audience for example mm. you know how would it be received in a different context mm. um, would this film um, have the sheen of authenticity about it I'm not sure but I think that perhaps the broader point or the broader question underneath is you know why are why why is this film being made um what does it have to do with britain really to be talking about the holocaust or about holocaust memory in this way and using film as a vehicle for holocaust memory and that you know that's a much bigger topic and i think britain as a nation has grappled with that um over many decades and continues to grapple with it um such as debates around having a Holocaust memorial in, in London, which have been rumbling on and on and on for, for many years now as well, about whether it's right for Britain to be remembering um, or, or even to be using art forms to, to, to sort of claim some sort of ownership over this history. It's, um, it, it's a complex debate and I don't think there's really any agreement over it. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, Robin. I'll, I'll in a moment. Um, I mean, just I think the most the most British um, addition to the film is, is Mick Jagger. You know, I'm just going to throw that in, Robin. Over to you. 
Yeah, I had to just Google to make sure I wasn't seeing things at that point. Um, <laughs> I think for me, I like I did kept I kept noticing they were that it wasn't German, if you know what I mean. Like it kind of took me out ever so slightly. And I think there is a risk that it's not historically grounded in the particularity that led to Nazi Germany. Having said that, the conversation around Berlin, and as you said, Greg, the kind of it situated itself in such a particular history in that way. And in some ways it was interesting because I, I felt I was able to read myself in more as a, you know, a Jewish woman into that story because it was British and I'm British. So it's kind of interesting actually seeing Holocaust art, if that's the right, even that, even that phrase feels tricky, doesn't it? Um, being able to put myself in in that way. But I did find it jarring. And I also thought to myself, and I, I wasn't quick enough to be able to find out, like, were the actors queer? Were there any Jewish actors? Um, not that there were Jewish characters, actually, but who was writing it? And I think that's maybe a conversation that we're much more aware of now. And it goes back to the David Baddiel book, which is one of the stronger parts of his book, I think, about who's acting, who's telling whose story, um, which is, again, is what I think um, Hannah was talking to about Holocaust memory and how we tell that. So um, I don't know the answer to that, but I thought that was quite interesting as well. So, yes, I also felt a bit unsure of the... Uh, complete not even trying to um be german within that yeah uh greg i'll i'll hand over to you in a moment but um i noticed when when i looked at the credits just now uh you know because he said were there any uh jewish actors rachel weiss is in it but just i think we have to work out who she i mean it said she was one of the prostitutes it said in the credits um, so I think we'll have to go, we'll have to rewind now and find out, you know, who she was, because she obviously wasn't the, the famous Rachel Weiss yet, um, that, that she is now, but yeah, great. Britishness and the, the film, what did, what did it, what did it do to the film for this um, to be a British production? I mean, it took me out of it a little bit and I was interested about the, um, what Robin just said about who has access to those stories. And that's certainly something we're more attuned to. Uh, now I think Ian McKellen was probably not out at the time but had played lots of queer coded uh, roles so that's interesting about who has access to these history and I also think so the Britishness aside I think that illuminates some of the anxiety I spoke about at the beginning as 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 queer people we don't have lineage you know we we choose our forebears we don't have a, a through line in the same way that say like Romani people or Jewish people have and I think that that becomes a sticking point about who has access to certain storytelling because our heritage is almost a thing that we have to uh, sort of self-select in a way and and I I wonder yeah I'm curious now about the making of it in a way that probably I wasn't when I first saw it like 10 years ago or something um, but yeah, there might be more nuance in that that reflection than I than I've got time to think of. It starts just off the top of my head. And can I just add in? I think it's very interesting because the thing about Jewish heritage aligned with that because the Holocaust is, of course, a time where you can't everything is lost, and actually to try and trace lineage through and backwards is impossible. So that's also something I hadn't quite thought about that as a a joining story of what it is to then have to step into some, you know, it's really just interesting, just thought I'd throw that in. Yeah. I mean, uh, to me as a kind of, um, I'm probably sort of tri-cultural person now, but sort of grown up bicultural German American in Germany, uh, maybe the most British thing about the film, again, was Mick Jagger and the entertainment value. Uh, which is kind of foregrounded at the start at the start because the you know Mick Jagger sort of appears before we sort of see the rest of the story. Um, but it also seems to mix in so many other films sort of from that genre of Holocaust film, you know, Visconti, the Dam, it seems to be all over the you know depiction of um the gay um Nazis in uniform and the, the kind of parties and um but also uh, the night porter, you know, I think there's also a dose of the, the night porter in there. Uh, so, I, you know, it seems to kind of use a particular sort of um, sub genre of Holocaust film where, I mean, but there's so many films now, they always have to have a song and dance scene. And ideally they have to have a, a woman who's dressed like Sally Bowles, um, you know, in, uh, and so, I mean, I think this film is, is it's it's a way in which the film kind of positions itself in this in this genre, but it also seems to kind of 
foreground that in a way where other other films seem to embed that more in the narrative, but we, we see it at the start. So first there's Mick Jagger and then there's the, the rest of the film. Um, I think for, for a German Holocaust film, I mean, there aren't, it's interesting, there aren't really many German Holocaust films as such. I mean, there are some, but not, not as many. But I think, I mean, that would be pretty unthinkable, you know, to start with a song and dance sequence in that way. Um, yeah, uh, we have some more questions. I'll uh, read those out. Uh, one question here. I have just read a very interesting article by Odea Cohen Raz on Holocaust films, which choose in, a diff in different ways to use lying to undercut the bigger lies of the Nazis. It is a striking argument and allows a particular kind of taking seriously that overcomes the problem of truthfulness in Holocaust fictions. I don't know if any of you wanted to to take that up. I mean, just to say, I think that's fascinating and I'd really like to read the article because I, I would never have thought about it in that way. Um, I did find myself, however, kind of, as a kind of counter to it, and I was watching the film, weirdly also thinking, I wonder how a, a Holocaust denier would take aspects of this because there were clearly moments where it, it wasn't, you know, there was a fantastical element to it, um, or be it was quite clear that that was it. But I did, I was put into that mindset of, gosh, could this be used against us? Is what I was thinking. <laughs> That's kind of the uh, traumatized, wounded Jew and woman, I think. But um, so I wonder, you know, I really like the theory of it, but I actually wonder in practice. It's really interesting about how you undercut and how you persuade and um, subvert the lies. Um, so. I kind of like yet to be convinced, but I really want to read the article because I think it could be a really interesting perspective and maybe change my opinion about it. Yeah, I mean, there's one of the seminal German Holocaust films uh, called Jacob the Liar, uh, which we showed last year for Holocaust Memorial Day. And we had a discussion panel about it, which was also very interesting, but which seems to kind of take this idea head on. Um, the lying, the lying, the lying Jew, effectively, which, as you is, or who, as you say, is a is an anti-Semitic trope, but then inverts inverts that sort of. Yes, but I think that's always the issue that these films are dogged by and plagued by is that they could become tools in the hands of of Holocaust deniers. So. Um, and I thought it was really interesting, Greg, what you said at the start, you know, how hard it must be for a filmmaker to dare to make a Holocaust film, uh, especially now after there's been so much debate and so much discussion. Um, and you know, most film filmmakers seem in some way or another to be clued into the discussion and seem to try to take it into account. But it must be such a such a burden um, to, 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 to even dare to make a film then. So maybe having having these outrageous fictions and these lies as a way of kind of confronting the problem boldly by kind of foregrounding it rather than edging around it. Um, it but so, sometimes that's just interesting what it sparked off something that I wanted to mention about um, uh, Minyan, the other, um, the other film that was set in the early 80s. Sometimes when the film is about something else, and, and the Holocaust and memories are its context. Sometimes I feel like it's done more te te tenderly and more authentically that way. So I felt like Minyam came out of a very particular New York Jewish um, culture of survivors and their families. But really I felt like it was a, a film that was about coming of age, but also pre-shadowing of, of AIDS. And because it was the context, almost like the subtext and not the text, I felt that it was very, just very, um, persuasive and beautifully done and there was a really I mean I, I'd love to talk more about kind of the connection between AIDS culture and and, and Holocaust cultural production because I think there's some really amazing parallels that Jewish artists have utilized for, for incredible ends and if you remember the storyline in Minyan where the, the older gay couple one of them dies I mean they're never really um, described as a gay couple but um, but he um, he finds uh, his route to that knowledge by witnessing their double bed and all of this. It's really beautifully done. And one of them dies and the other one has no recourse to stay in their home and is 
is going to be thrown out. Well, that's an AIDS storyline. I mean, that was a that was a, a really profound condition of 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 gay couples um, living through the first fifteen years of the pandemic that they had no legal recourse to each other. So if one person died, the other person very often would wouldn't be able to visit them in hospital and would be kicked out of the apartment. And I felt like that was such a beautiful foreshadowing of that story because it's in the nineteen eighties, but also places it in this particular locus of you know, a Jewish Russian um, immigrants. And I just thought it was a very, very clever bit of storytelling where the, where the Holocaust was the context uh, or the subtext and not the text. And that was, so sometimes when it's come up from a scans, it's done in a much more persuasive and aesthetically um, confident way almost. Thank you. We have two more questions. So should I maybe read these out and we, we have, about five minutes left, we could still take those. Um, maybe they're maybe they're parallel questions even. So the first one is it was interesting how Max made a point that the perpetrators could also be queer. It's really difficult to consider this. Does anyone have any thoughts about the gay men abusing gay men in such horrific contexts? And the second one is in Habua. I felt quite early on that Ashraf, the Palestinian character, was doomed, but I felt really angry that his character was turned into a suicide bomber. So maybe I'll just throw these out and see whether you wanted to take up any of these. I, I didn't see the second film, but so I was certainly, my ears picked up at the reference to, to Ernst Röhm in the in in bent um and i mean he was I, I would say that that's not even an historical reality it's a contemporary reality and when i see um gay republicans performing homo nationalism and uh, uh, you know and and being loyal to the state over say migrants living with hiv or migrants of any uh, background to be honest and choosing affiliation to the state over a person in need I feel like that that is happening now to a greater or lesser extent. So it doesn't surprise me at all that in, in any place where power is being abused, that queer people will be amongst the people to reap the benefits. That's just a historical reality. And actually, anecdotally, the followers of Ernst Rome, who were very often his, his you know, beautiful young male lovers, were potentially some of the first gay men to be interred because of the purge that that, that Hitler performed against uh, Ernst Rome. It was more or less a gay social circle. So that's, I mean, that's historical fact. And part of the thing that art can do, I think, as we were saying before, is, is bring that nuance to light without trying to hold uh, a community responsible, but rather hold history uh, accountable. And so, yeah, it's it's absolutely a matter of historical fact that that happened. And it doesn't surprise me, people assimilate to power where, where they can find it. And the concept of a gay community and thereby some kind of fraternal response to your gay brothers or gay sisters is quite a recent phenomenon. You know, it's, it's kind of a post-sexual revolution and for us more often post-AIDS phenomenon. I, I feel like the, the, that kind of loyalty, it, uh, disloyalty feels like an affront to us, but probably would not have occurred to them as a, that the concept of a gay community could even have been enacted possibly and certainly not by someone um, in the SS, you know? So yeah, just wanted to, to point that out. Yeah, I was going to say something very similar about, you know, the oppressed becoming the oppressor and how that is, as that happens. And I think for me that that question, um, and I haven't seen the other film to comment on um, the, stere you know, ending up in stereotypical roles, but there's, there, they are kind of joint questions in some ways. But that scene on the train, um, which again was the moment that I found really uncomfortable where he ends up having to beat um, his lover, his partner, um, and says, I don't know him. Um I found that very difficult. And then the German officer grabs him by the genitalia. And I thought, God, really, do you need to do that? It felt really kind of over the top in that way, but then also true. But there was something so camp about the officers as well. It felt like actually there was a lot of repressed sexuality and stepping into it. Um, and the bit I actually say that I got the most angry at in this moment was um, the officer kind of crying after he'd done this act and the boy had died. And I that I just thought, 
come on. Like, I know there is a really important story to tell that we all have the capacity to evil within ourselves and that there's no them and us. And if we do that, we step into that same thing. But that just felt too much at the wrong moment to step into it. But I did, I did. Yeah, it's a very, uncom- it was really uncomfortable. So I'm glad the question was asked because that was definitely a theme kind of going on within it. And the positions that people are put in when they're um, persecuted and um, that victim blaming you just spoke about, Greg, like, I really felt that with Max that the light and the um, the spotlight was on him and what he was doing in that moment and the choice he had to make and the violence he enacted almost more than the officers. And for me, I thought, no, we're we're looking at the wrong. This is the wrong spotlight. Um, I don't want to be either sympathising with the officer in that moment or more distraught at what Max has had to do. Um, so I think that speaks to something of the questions but and where I was sitting with that scene. Thanks, Robin. Hannah, do you want to take the closing word? Oh, that's a big responsibility. It's a big responsibility. <laughs> yeah, um, I would very much echo what uh, what Greg and Robin said and their responses there. I mean, it was it was making me think of um, many of the things that they said. You know, this this idea, this sort of Christopher Browning idea that we all need to face up to the reality that anybody um, can be a perpetrator. Uh, you know, in in those circumstances, and and also as Robin just outlined. Um, very eloquently as well that scene on the train just demonstrated the way that that max himself um is able to shed his loyalty to his partner to his lover in that moment and turn from being the oppressed to the oppressor um so it, it, we see those parallels later on of course um which is what the questioner was was referring to and i think it's just an echo of that and it's deeply uncomfortable absolutely it's deeply uncomfortable but but quite rightly i think is Greg says, his, historically accurate, and maybe that's a real strength of the film, that it makes us feel uncomfortable because it's it's showing us something of the, of the truth. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for this, uh, maybe not the perfect word to say in this context, but nonetheless, uh, a wonderful, inspiring discussion. Um, I wish we could carry on and maybe we can carry on in another in another form. There is the green room after the the panel now where we can meet and sort of uh, wind down informally. But yeah, great. Thanks to you all. Thank you to our audience as well. And um, yeah, all the best. <laughs>